Um, again, thank you for the organisers for allowing me to um, come here to uh, come here to this uh, conference. And uh, I'm as. Uh, Basil said, we, um, I've known Basil actually for a long time, but, um, but we, we, we met up about uh, 18 months ago and, uh, and he was showing me the work as, he, as he's already alluded to. And, um, and, I, uh, and he asked me if it was, you know, whether we thought we could actually put some sort of experimental program together. And uh, so I called this emerging experiments uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the sort of, you know, as uh, the conferences. And emerging theories are only ever accepted, in my opinion, if they are accompanied by repeatable experiments. And I think that was some of the things that Jem and them were saying that, you know, we need to do this. And um, experimentalists like myself uh, always look for new experiments. Actually, I, I care very little about theories at times because I'm more worried about the practicalities of wh where do we look for new physics. And in fact, I'm just going to briefly mention that. Uh, just over a year ago, as I said, Basil approached me about this uh, we hadn't seen each other for a long time, and um, so it was quite nice, actually, to, to meet up with him as well socially, and, but also to, 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 to do this. And, um, and uh, he specifically wanted me to look at the reconstruction of tracks of Schrodinger particles in the Young's two-slit experiment, uh, and, the, and using this weak measurement technique, which I didn't know anything about at all. I'd never heard of, so I had to scurry away and start reading about it and um, hopefully I know a little bit more now. But there's a first step, because um, I think to do this uh, with atoms is extremely challenging. And so I decided that um, I would do, start off with a much easier, which I think is probably an easier experiment, which is dealing with the, um, an extended version of stern gerlach which I'm going to describe. So ultimately, these experiments, I think, are extremely challenging. And, uh, and I want to congratulate, I think, to Steinberg's in the audience who did the experiment with the photons. And I want to congratulate his group for actually, you know, I think it's a wonderful experiment. And uh, I'm coming to realize how difficult this is. So I want to report to you about the progress I've got. I'm, I had hoped that I might get some, experiment, uh, some results, but unfortunately, uh, real life experiments don't run to the timetable that you'd hoped. So where do we look for new physics? I actually work in the high energy particle group at UCL. So I'm normally worried about things like the LHC. I've been on the bar bar experiment at Stanford. Um, and so we've been, so obviously we look at uh, 14 TV kind of levels, or we're hoping to, uh, they're upgrading. Uh, but also, I also have my, my main interest now is actually in precision measurements with low backgrounds. The child with the LHC, of course, he's got his high backgrounds, although they are talking about now building the linear collider, which will have much lower backgrounds. But anyway, that's for the future. And uh, I shall probably be retired before they even get that off the drawing board. So emerging quantum mechanics, uh, quantum mechanics are there new ways of looking at this problem? And are there more fundamental issues to, to be addressed? And um, these two guys here, Motley, Motley Pear, and uh, they, they're actually busy, obviously, trying to address these problems. Um, it's a pity that David can't be here. I'm sure he would uh, appreciate this conference greatly. So as I said, we, we, at UCL, we have a large group on Atlas. And as you know, they think that, uh, well, not think that uh, they discovered a Higgs boson. They confirmed the mass is approximately around the 125 MeV uh, region, and it's spin zero but they're now measuring all the couplings and you know, whether they can see it operating in the expected channels and so forth. Um, in fact, uh, we've just heard that there's rumors, the rumor mill is out, that in fact uh, the Nobel uh, Prize for this year um, will be announced on the 8th of October, I'm told, and this, uh, this mechanism, the Brout, Englert, Higgs mechanism is the favorite, but we'll wait till Tuesday to find out. It's a bit of a shame, actually, I think, that um, this guy here, Tom Kibble from Imperial College, is not being mentioned. And I always felt, and, and um, I think Stephen Weinberg, uh, an address I saw him uh, at Imperial College, stated that he felt that Tom really was the person. People like Tom, there are others, but were really starting this whole process off back in, God knows, long before I was thought of. And, um, but what we haven't found at the LHC is a hint of Susie. And I think this is the understatement of the year where this guy's from the perimeter and said, the null results are not making people happy. 
and, um, and I can see that. I'm actually rather grateful we haven't found this because as somebody who doesn't have a very good memory, it does now mean I might not have to remember the 126 Susie particles and everything that they do. So uh, perhaps I should be cheerful, I don't know. But anyway, what I work in is neutrinos. Um, neutrino oscillations is one of the big things that have been discovered over the last 10 to 20 years. And we now know that they have mass and they mix. And there are precision measurements measuring uh, these mixing angles. But one thing we don't know is whether the neutrino is a Dirac or Majorana. We don't know about its mass scale and so on and so forth. And I'm on this experiment and I'm building this at the moment. So I'm building it. I'm part of the team building this Super Nemo where we're looking for neutrinos double beta decay. And if anybody's interested, I'm happy to chat about it after in the break at lunch. Uh, there is also precision measurements. As you know, G minus 2 is an also precision measurement, and we have a group on that at Brookhaven. Um, or sorry, not at Brookhaven, at Fermilab, because this was the way it was at Brookhaven. It's now moved to Fermilab, and, uh, and they're hoping to push down and see if there's any deviation from the standard model. Okay, so why weak measurement? Well, what I've, what I've found and what I've read up about is that the fact that this may allow you to amplify small signals. Because that's the, that's the game we're in at the moment, is looking at very small signals, can we amplify them? All right, it's unique in the sense that the quantum system seems to effectively amplify itself, which is rather, uh, and that means that you don't have to put any amplifier on, because as we know, any generalized amplification will always introduce noise. You can't, you can't avoid it, as far as I'm aware, anyway. So, we're going to look for tracks of Schrodinger particles. Um, tracks of photons have already been demonstrated. In principle, we can construct, uh, reconstruct these tracks. Um, and also, if we do, then we hope this will be the first evidence of the quantum potential. And uh, I just thought I'd mention Schrodinger. If we can't, you know, he's Austrian. We ought to, we ought to have him there. And uh, so, you know, I don't, want to I don't want to be disrespectful to my host. OK, the original stern gerlach experiment. I just you all know about this, but just to remind you, we need a furnace, we need a magnet, we need some kind of screen or some kind of detector. Now, when in this configuration, this is what we would normally call a strong measurement. Now, I've actually cheated here a little bit, because if, when this magnetic field is at a level where you don't have clear separation, but you've got a little bit, that is what is kind of working at in terms of the weak measurement. Okay, it's not the way it was first de uh, defined, but uh, I want you to just keep that in mind. Okay, and so Aronov et al. asked, "What would happen if you followed one by the other?" And they called this post-selection. And I'm going to illustrate that now. Uh, oh, by the way, I just thought I'd uh, show you the original uh, results from Stern Gerlach. All right, uh, just thought it was. Uh, uh, so so this is where the magnet's off, this is where the magnet's on, and you can see, you know, it's uh, the whole revolution in quantum mechanics all based on this rather dirty, smudgy piece of... Uh, so empires have been built on less. Okay, so this paper here by Duck Stevenson and Sudeshan illustrates how you could do this experiment using this extended stern gerlach The particles come in here, they're already pre-polarized, they go through a stern gerlach with this weak, um, uh, with a weak field, and then they go through a strong field, and, uh, and then you get this amplification effect. Uh, notice that these are non-commuting variables. This is in the z-axis uh, in, in my diagram, uh, and this is in the x-axis. Um, and then the weak value for this apparatus is given quite simply by lambda, which is basically the magnetic moment of the particle and tan alpha over two of this. And of course, what happens, because this is a tangent, you can see that as alpha approaches pi, then aw gets really large. And that's where this kind of notional amplification effect comes from. This gets really big. Um, the other thing I want you to note is that we actually need three magnets here. We need one here to pol do the pre-polarization. We need one here, and we need one here. So. When I agreed to do this, oh, so these are the predicted results, um, which I don't think I'll go through, because I really want to get onto the practical stuff. There is also an optical analog of this, okay? And the optical analog is you use polarizers, you use a birefringent lens for the weak, 
aspect, and then you use uh, another polarizer to do the strong. So these are the sort of three magnet equivalents here. Um, and that experiment has been done by Richie et al. And, uh, and there's the paper, and you can see here they use the, a, a laser source, the polarizers, the birefringent lens in this polarizer, and they use a CCD camera, as I recall, to, uh, as a detector. Um, and this is their results. You can see as they change the angle of the polarizers, it gradually, you end up with the characteristic double bump. Okay, so the experimental proposal for me and Basil put together is that we would first try and do this for atoms, and then we would turn our attention to the much more difficult Young's two-slit experiment, and then obviously compare this with the quantum potential model. Now, when I agreed to do this, and um, there were some times I kind of regret doing this, actually, because I didn't realize how bloody difficult this was going to be, I came back, we was in Sweden at the time, and I came back on the plane while he was eyeing up the aerostesses, I was busy, in my mind, figuring out the list of things that I would need to do. And of course, I need a furnace, I need magnets, I need three magnets, as I've described, and I need, obviously, some kind of vacuum system, pumps, and so on and so forth. And this is, uh, this is the one that was already been done uh, previously, where this, uh, you can see uh, they, they use potassium atoms in this particular one. And this is uh, where the atoms come down. through in a magnet, and then you end up with uh, this character. And they use this iron gauge type of uh, detector at the bottom here to detect the particles and so on. Now, when you're faced with a blank piece of ground in my laboratory, in the laboratory I share, it's difficult. You think to yourself, how the hell am I going to do this? What's going to fill the space? And obviously, the first thing I needed to worry about is a vacuum chamber. And one of the joys of being a member of a very old university has got some very dark corners where stuff hides away. And this was actually sitting there with the two pumps and the chamber, must be about 10 grand's worth of equipment, was sitting there literally doing nothing. And so I stole it and uh, moved it to my laboratory. No, I didn't. I got the guy's permission, but he didn't want it. He was going to go in the skip, actually. So um, I took it, but obviously it was old. I needed to refurbish it. And I've spent a long time doing that. The chamber, there was, uh, and also the pumps and all that. They all needed stripping down, and uh, we've got there. We then needed to, obviously, need a magnet. Now, I've never designed a magnet in my life, and I didn't know where to start again. And obviously, with the three magnets we need, I need some, I need a lot of control. I need, uh, you know, I need to worry about this. But fortunately, I have a contact at the Cockcroft Institute. Jim Clark does, he's headed up the magnet design group up there. And I went and paid him a, a visit. I said to him, Jim, I've got no money. I can't pay you a bean to do this, but would you please design me a magnet? And he said, yes, I would. The only proviso is that if you do publish a paper at the end, you'll put me on the paper, which I felt was a reasonable thing to do. And he did this. Well, Kiri, is, is the guy who works with him, did this. And, um, and this is what it got. Now, I, from my calculations, I wanted some about 70 a gradient of about 70 tesla per meter. And in fact, he reckoned with this, we could get about 113. And so this is it. This is one of the magnets. How am I doing for time, by the way? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. OK. I'm worried about this thing going off, so yeah, yeah, OK. But I'm, OK. So this is it. I've built this. This is one of the strong magnets. I've built it. Um, as you can see there, um, it, it took a, a quite a long time because I had to wind all the cores myself, and that takes uh, quite a time. So anyway, that's what I did. I then sent it back to the Cockcroft because they have a big setup where they can measure the field very accurately, and, um, and they did that for me. And in fact, um, the, the crucial thing is that, um, or is that the gradient they were measuring for one amp current through the coils all right, oh, going up to about one and a half amps. It starts to get a bit warm at this sort of level, so I didn't want to push it too far. But notice we can get up to 150 tesla per meter, which astounded me for something which, uh, you know. And also, I think I could push it to two amps if I wanted to, but it depends whether I need to or not. And also, so that all went very well. Then, of course, you have to choose yourself an atom. We know silver works. But of course, I would actually like to do this. If I can get it working, I'd like to try several candidates. 
but, they, 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 but there is a kind of a commonality, is that if you want them to travel about a metre, two metres, then you need to get your vacuum down to about 10 to minus 5 tor, all right? You're going to boil these off. You're going to want a temperature up to about 1,000 degrees. Obviously, the different candidates will, will boil off at various levels. So I therefore designed my furnace to, and my vacuum system to run with these kinds of um, um, characteristics. And so we want to be able to use several types of atoms. So I designed it to run at 1,000 degrees. This is just, I mean, I've got all the drawings, but this is just the way it looks. All right, and in fact, there it is mounted in its uh, enclosure. Um, it's operating um, uh, uh, to, to specification, which is always uh, an amazing feat for an experimentalist, and to get things right first time, but I did. And um, so, now, the thing that I really want to discuss, the thing that I really want to think about is this weak magnet. Now, the two wave functions, when they're going through the weak magnet, as I've said, are not clearly separated. And in the language of Duck and Sudarshan, they say the two wave functions of the spin array along the Z axis have to be partially separated, but remain overlapping. All right, whatever that means. So this implies that, contrary to what Peter had been saying here about the wave function, about it don't exist, this actually implies that somehow it must have extension in space to a simple mind like myself. And I want to know is how do I calculate this? How do I actually deal with this situation? So, and th therefore that would then lead on to say, does what, what strength does the, ma the weak magnet have to be so that I know that I've done step one? Well, the closest, um, oh, sorry, sorry, yes, the, the, uh, how I then know that I've achieved this partial overlapping. And so the, my immediate thought was to look at the wavelength of the atoms, which you can calculate is of the order of about 10 to minus 11 meters. Is this the correct parameter to use? It's an open question as far as I'm concerned. I'm quite happy to do whatever. Now, but if I use this wavelength, then I work out to actually try and separate the two by about this kind of distance, 10 to minus 10 perhaps, um, then I need the, the magnet to be of this, to the field to be, the, the gradient to be of this order of magnitude. And at the moment, that's, the, that's what I'm working, that's what I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working to. But of course, if you, if anybody in the audience has other ideas and would like to put them forward for consideration, I would be very glad to hear. Okay, so just finishing off. So this autumn, I've, as you can see, I've got all the pieces, and um, so I'm going to, I'm putting it together, um, and, uh, and I'm obviously then going to introduce the, the magnets one at a time and check each one as they're working. Um, and then obviously I will run this thing several times and hopefully observe this week measurement and hopefully that it will come up to uh, what we expect. I had thought actually that in fact if I could do this, I could actually work slightly backwards and actually... And, and, if I could get clear values of this and unambiguous, which would be a feat in itself, but then if I could, then it occurred to me, in fact, I could maybe answer this wave function question, the width of, whatever, as I say, whatever that means, by actually varying the weak magnet to see when I lose it, lose the weak values, and obviously when they come back again. And from the strength of, that, of the magnet at that point, I could then work backwards and say to you, right, this is the kind of separation that would have been achieved, and, uh, and that may give us some indication of what the width of a wave function is. Now, um, it's a very uh, a speculative statement, and, um, but uh, it does occur to me that there may be some scope here to, to do more than just measure the weak values. So, I'd like, and then obviously after that, that's when I start applying my brain to how we build the, uh, the, the, the two-slit experiment. Um, which, I, which, is, which is another step on. And certainly, if I do do that, um, I can't do it by just sort of stealing bits of equipment from around the lab. This is going to have to be properly financed, and, um, and I'm going to have to write a proper proposal and, uh, and get some money to do it. Okay, so just to finish off, I'd like to thank Basil. Well, I'm not sure if I should thank him or not, actually, but maybe, <laughs> maybe I'll wait and see. But uh, anyway, I, I, I like to be nice to people, so I'd like to thank him. 
All right. I'd like to thank especially the guys at the Cockcroft for designing the magnet. Whatever results we get, uh, they've, done a, they've done a great job for free. And uh, I'd also like to thank my boss. I always like to thank my boss because I, I creep a lot. And uh, I'd like to earn brownie points. But he, he's supported us with some money. I've had to buy stuff. There's also a private individual, Taher Gazelle, who's also given us some money um, to buy materials and so on. And then eventually, I'd like to always thank the, the technicians never get a thanks. Right? And in fact, Derek is building this, not me. And therefore, Derek should need his forte is actually building model tanks. But. But there is. Anyway, thanks so much. I have a comment and another comment. Uh, the first one is, uh, you work at UCL, and I know those first guys in your nanoscience institute, they have millions of pounds in shiny, ultra-high vacuum equipment and yeah. high-value uh, magnets as well. If you can convince them to do something, they might be interested. Yeah, in that's true. I think, and I agree with you absolutely, Verna. It's not, uh, I'm not discriminating you at all. I agree with you absolutely. The thing is, is that Basil and I's thoughts are, is that if we could put together this and actually see something, even if we can't do you know, the precise, but if we can actually observe something, then I could then, I think, with some justification, go to people and say, look, we've seen this, it's got promise, can we now start spending some real money? That, uh, that's just basically what we're doing. So I agree with you, absolutely. So, and then the second one uh, about the wavelengths. Now, if I go from, from the hydrogen model or from the silver model, basically the wavelength or the, the, the wave function has the dimension of the atom. So basically, I would say uh, the characteristic wave length is about two angstroms minimum. Two tens, ten minus ten. Yeah. yeah okay. One order of magnitude larger. Yeah. And then use that as a as the parameter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. <clears throat> I think what you care about is the transverse coherence length of your beam. Pardon, sorry. Well, Trans, transverse coherence length of your beam. That's what you care about. Yes. And, and there, I mean, people have been doing atom interferometry for decades now, and you should easily be able to find their beam parameters, and it will depend on the size of your oven, the collimation, But have transverse. they actually faced this problem of what an overlapping wave function of, is? Of course. They, and they I don't know if Marcus Arndt is well, he's not here but he, he will totally probably be able to tell you. He I'm will not come. I'm totally convinced by that statement. But anyway, that's fine. That's fair enough. That's what I wanted to, to find out where people have things. Are, you know, so that's fine. It's, it's a lot of uh, high accuracy, high precision. Yeah, oh, no, no, I appreciate that. No, I appreciate the comment. Thank you.